okay. Let's start. One minute early. We mm -hmm. like to be early with Finnish jeans. Sorry for that. <laughs> anyway, thanks every uh, thanks Steve for being here again, and welcome mm -hmm. to all of you and you too, Steve. And uh, I, I just thought that if we start with a very very easy picture, so you could uh, just say some words about it. Let me see if I can back, get back to share screening. There we go. No. Oh, what the f now you've got to go to screen mode uh, to no. uh, presentation mode. You're, yeah, yeah. you're showing it uh, that duplicate is what you need to duplicate rather than um, on your on um, PowerPoint. Choose you duplicate screens rather than present a screen. Sorry. Do you see my do you see a whole screen now? Yeah, and not yet. We're still seeing your um, we're seeing the view you have. There you go. That's better. Yep. Oh, hang on. Not yet. <laughs> Are you kidding me? What's happening? Go in PowerPoint and your choice when, when you do go for screen presentation is to duplicate, not show your speaker view. That one, sorry. No. Okay. Yep, let's see. Yes, now you're okay. Thank you. I have a good co-captain on your side. Thanks a lot. So anyway, I just thought like, you know, with your books and your forthcoming book and almost everything you write, you have been consistent with debunking neoclassical economics. So why is that important to do that? Fundamentally, because it's a bit like Ptolemaic astronomy. Uh, it's a neat, plausible and completely wrong description of reality. And if you go use something like that to guide uh, your behavior about you know, the, you know, the, how to get to Mars, if you're talking astronomy, or how to manage the economy, if you're talking economics, you're going to make disastrously bad mistakes, uh, which is what we've been doing really for 50 years, uh, at least since these guys took over from Keynes. And we're now, I think, facing an ecological crisis as well, courtesy of their um, plausible, totally wrong model of how the economy operates. Okay, so in order to, to actually save society and environment, we need to get rid of their and debunk their theories. Absolutely. Okay, I think that's a, a, a good course. So, and then Minsky, uh, it's a system dynamics and monetary modeling to economics. So what, what, what's your aim with it? Fundamentally, you, if you're going to get rid, get rid of an old paradigm, you need a new one. Yeah. You certainly crit criticize an existing one, but you won't uh, to, to, you know, derail it until you have an alternative. And for me, the alternative to a neoclassical economics, which is all equal about equilibrium and uh, a barter model of capitalism, is non-equilibrium system dynamics with a monetary model. So there's been system dynamics programs now for about 50 years. They would have been much more popular if economists hadn't trashed them without understanding them, predominantly William Nordhaus who's also the one who's trashed the planet with his uh, nonsense theory of, of explanations of climate change. Um, so you need an alternative model for doing that. Minsky has been built to do both. So it's system dynamics, which there've been many, many programs over the last 50 years, which are popular outside economics. Um, what Minsky adds is the capacity to model the monetary system using double entry bookkeeping. Okay, and uh, this is not that central banks or any economics do it today? I've been in, in contacted by some central banks to uh, start to use Minsky as, as a modeling tool. Um, and uh, there are various people starting to make use of it. And there are like in, inside the Bank of England, for example, there's a fairly large group doing what's called stock flow consist consistent modeling, which uses similar technology to Minsky. Um, so that is happening to some degree, but fundamentally, uh, central banks are dominated by neoclassical economists. And because of that, they, the only way they think you can model the economy as, as, as if it's an equilibrium, which is something which would have been very sensible in the 19th century. We didn't have computers to model that of equilibrium systems, but it's completely stupid in the 21st. And they're basically, because they believe they've got something advanced, they're holding us back in a 19th century way of thinking. Okay, thanks. That brings us to uh, us to our agenda, and, and we are concentrating on on the monetary systems uh, place in economy. Actually, so the agenda today is money creation first uh, through banks, and then uh, state through central banks. 
And then we're going to look at a few examples to see if we how we can use this. And we're also going to look at mis misconceptions around this, as Steve said, because there is quite a lot in neoclassical economics that is like not true. And that uh, um, that's included into the monetary system then. And after that, we go in, look into private debt and consequences in macroeconomics. And you're going to use Minsky, if I understand right, Steve? Yeah, I've got a, a set of slides that I gave last time around, but yeah. I might improvise around them to, uh, in, in case anybody's come in for a, a second dose, that I'll have some uh, improvisation to start with about how you use Minsky to model monetary dynamics and, and, and why the mainstream views are wrong and the, the simple way that banks create money and the simple general principle for money yeah. creation as well. Okay, great. And after that, we can look into a bit what we need you know what, what happens with the uh, uh, the consequences of private debt if we have a government deficit or government surpluses okay and also look into an example on that and after that we're going to have a few words about next webinar and then q a so that's today's agenda but before we get started with it i think like the, these these are the kind of questions we would like to to or what I said, this is something we would like to understand. It's like, this is uh, uh, Ingves is the governor of the Swedish Riksbank. And in a press conference, he said like, uh, 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 talks about this, their decision to lend up to 500 billion Swedish crowns to companies via the banks. Okay, we don't need to comment on that, but when it says that they are gonna borrow from the central banks via the banks, to corporations, we already know there's some misconceptions going on there. Okay, so we, mm -hmm. we'll get back to the later on. And then another one also, and this is also from the Swedish Riksbanks actually, when they are uh, talking about QE and they say, when the Riksbank buys securities such as bonds, these are converted into pure money and they mean reserves. Uh, in the form of new money, which is reserves in the bank's accounts with the Riksbank. This means that there will be a large surplus of money in the Swedish banking system. The banks can use this new money in transactions with each other and mm. then lend to companies and house, households and buy other assets with it. So I think it's quite good because they say things like this all the time. And what should the politicians, you know, what, what should they do if, if the experts go around and say things like that? So when we are done with today, I think it, this will be quite clear. So anyway, if uh, it's all yours then, Steve, I stop sharing. So we go to the agenda money creation then. Okay, all right. Well, let's just actually bring up my slides here and start sharing my slides. But what, I, what I'm gonna do first of all, I mean, that was a very useful quote to bring up, uh, you see, because this, this is conventional thinking about how banks create money. And the idea is the banks have to lend from reserves. And that was actually, if you wouldn't mind going back and showing that slide again, just quickly, it's a very good one to compare. I'll just you know, shut down my sharing for a second and show okay. that one again. Yeah. Uh, let me see this. You should one. be able to share over the top of mine. This one. Not seeing it yet. You've got to share screen, I think. I'm sharing screen. Okay, pardon me. Am I actually seeing your screen or seeing? Pardon me, I've already gone to the wrong window. Okay, yes, share your screen again. Are you are you just having fun with me right now? No, I'm not. Okay, I'm, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> tell you what, look, I'll share my screen and I'll. There we go. That's it. Okay, so the bank buys securities, convert it into reserves, um, and this means there's a large surplus of reserves. Banks lend us new money. Uh, to lend to companies. So what the idea is they've got reserves and they'll lend from those reserves to households. So let's look at what that actually involved in, in, in having that happen. I'll go across to my screen now. Okay, I stopped sharing here then. Yeah, okay, so you should be seeing my screen now. Okay, yeah. and what I'm gonna do is look at that from the point of view of the package I mentioned called Minsky. Uh, and this is the, the idea of Minsky is to enable you to model what banks do. So that we now, uh, the fundamental thing we have that other programs don't have is this banking icon, uh, which is, I'm going to call this the banking sector. And let's now take a look at the banking sector. And the way that banks work is they work in terms of having assets 
and liabilities and equity. And when you think about the claims you have on other people versus the claims that they have on you, uh, then the your, your net worth is your assets minus your liabilities. I'm leaving out of this assets, which are uh, things you own and nobody else has any claim over. So this is looking at assets where you claims you have on other people, liabilities, claims other people have on you, the difference between the two is your equity relative to the rest of the world. So if you look at banks, what's being claimed by the your bank governor there is that there are banks have reserves and their loss of liabilities include deposits, uh, or fundamentally deposits, and the bank has its own equity. And I'm going, I, I'm going to be simple and just talk about equity as if they can spend their shares, which of course they can't. I need to be more accurate, I'd need to break it down into short term and long term equity, but that will do. So they're saying, well, by, by, the, by the, the, uh, the government, uh, and also the banks also own bonds. So we have bonds here, which are owned by the banks. And let's say we start off with, uh, let's say there's 10 in reserves and uh, 90 in bonds. And then over here, there's say 70 in deposits and 30 in bank equity, something like that. What Minsky is doing very simply is making sure that every row sums to zero because you have assets minus liabilities minus equity that has to equal zero. Now what the bank is saying, the central bank will buy bonds uh, from, the, from the bank. So what that means is there's going to be minus uh, the, 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 the less monetary value of bonds from the, uh, because they're being bought by the central bank, and I'll use CB to indicate the central bank from the bank. So that's their bonds fall, and that for me, their reserves rise. So you now have bonds, uh, to, to, buy, to pay those bonds, the banks get money put into their deposit account at the central bank, and that deposit account uh, is what we call reserves. Uh, the reserves are an asset of this private banks and a liability of the central bank. So that's the action that the bank think is going to now make it possible for the private banks to lend to the private sector. Well, okay, so let's, let's say lend from reserves, which is pretty pretty close to the words you had from your central bank governor there. If they're gonna lend from reserves, you've got to have a minus here. So lend from reserves to um, deposits. So I'll just use D for deposits there. So you're gonna lend. And we say, okay, well, that's got to therefore increase the amount of money that people have in their deposit accounts. And Minsky says, I'm sorry, you've made an accounting error. Okay. Because if reserves go down, your assets fall. If your assets fall, either your liabilities or equity has to fall as well. So what you're trying to do is put money in people's deposit accounts. Now you can't do it by paying out from reserves unless all loans are made in cash. And I can, I can indicate that in a more complicated vision, but Banks do not lend from reserves. And this is something which another central bank has made a, a large song and dance about, the Bank of England, starting back in 2014. The Bundesbank came along and said the same thing. Lent reserves have nothing to do with enabling lending. They are a consequence. You, you may need more reserves after you lend. You create a need to have additional reserves. If there are reserve requirements, if your loans rise, you have a uh, need for equity equity as well, if you have equity requirements too. But if you're going to try to create loans, then the way it's simply done, I'm going to now have loans up here as well. And uh, I'm going to leave that error there. Uh, lend by creating debt. So I'll show this particular case. This is say, well, you're going to have lend to deposits, which increases the loans. And we have over here, lend Hang on, okay, lend to deposits. And Minsky says that line's correct. This one's wrong, that one's correct. So in, cool. in, your, in your lend from reserves, actually they're going in, uh, in bankruptcy. Well, fundamentally the, the assets are falling. Now the only way that can work, uh, and I'm gonna indicate this here, is if, that, if, the, if the reserves go down and simultaneously the loans go up. Now I can do it that way, but of course, how, how, does, how is the private sector getting that money? Uh, because the private sector is consenting to have a liability entered against it, which is the loan. So those loans are a liability of the private sector. Why are you consenting to it? The only way that can actually make sense is if we take a look at another uh, element in the system. And now we bring up, uh, make this uh, the pub uh, public, non-bank public.
And now we take a look at the financial system from their point of view. So bring up their window on the, on the world. And uh, they have an asset, which is, is with the deposits I've created, showed earlier, but they also got a liability, which are the loans. Now let's get rid of this loan from reserve. Well, I'll leave it sitting there because it's a mistake, but we can, this is what neoclassical economists think happened because it's what they learned in their textbooks. And they've never actually gone and questioned are the textbooks actually correct? So in this case, uh, yes, okay, the, there's an, in, an, an increase. Um, they've got the, 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 um, the non-bank public have got more uh, deposits uh, and they've got more loans coming out of this, but how we make this one function, we've got to also presume that the, the, the um, private sector has cash as well. And okay, they'd be willing to accept that extra money there if they also get extra cash. So that now works. We come back over here and see what's going on. Uh, th that's the increase in the loan has occurred, but the only way you can lend from reserves are if loans are taken out in cash. Okay, so they have, okay. System, they have made the system. They they made the system where where all our money is cash. Yeah, they, what they're modelling is a world in which all loans take place in cash. So you decide to go and buy a new house in um, in Oslo. I don't know what the going house price. Well, let's say it's equivalent of a million euro. So you go to the bank, and the bank says, "Okay, we're willing to lend you a million euro to um, buy that buy that house in Oslo. Just give us a while to bundle up one uh, ten thousand a hundred euro bills." And I hope you have a security guard to help you out the bank to go and give them to the, to the person you're buying it from. Now that's not how banks operate at all. They, they, it is possible for um, lending from reserves to happen, but only if loans occur in either cash or an instrument you can take out of the bank. Now that is not what happens these days. That is a myth. Okay. So if we get rid of that myth and we get rid of this over here as well, what actually goes on is banks lending um, is has nothing to do with the reserves that the banking sector has. It's simply the willingness of the bank to lever up their equity. And uh, I've got the bank equity over here at 30. Um, so as they lend more money, they're levering up their equity. They might create say 10 times as many loans as they have equity. So they might create 300 initially out of that. That feeds into the overall economy and cause growth and so on. But banks lend these days by saying, that's a great idea to buy that house in Oslo. Here's a million euro equivalent we're going to put in your deposit account, uh, which you'll use to buy off the off the seller, and we will record a million dollars as a as a euro as a debt you owe to us in loans. So lending these days occurs by increasing deposits and increasing loans simultaneously, and that's the point of uh, what's called endogenous money creation. Banks create money by lending. The the act of lending creates the deposits. You don't need deposits in the first place to lend out money. You don't need uh, reserves to lend that money out. So okay. that's it, it's quite simple to show this. This is the normal situation for a normal bank. Yeah. So basically, uh, uh, the business idea of a bank is uh, indebting society. Yeah. Uh, banks. Banks. The business of banks is creating debt. Yeah. The way that they can run that business is by creating money at the same time. Yeah. So the lending of a bank uh, increases their assets and increases their liability simultaneously. But that then means because they've done that, you're willing to pay interest. So if you now pay interest on on the debt, then what is fundamentally going on? Uh, actually, I've got them in the banking sectors. So you're going to be taking money out of your deposit account and paying it to the bank. Mm. And that's then going to reduce your equity over here. Um, and, and that's that's fundamentally the simple the simplest model of bank lending. Now, what's going on here? With the banks getting more bonds from reserve from the uh, maybe the the, the uh, central bank giving them more reserves. It's irrelevant. Okay, it doesn't actually do much um, the, because it's incre It's changing the nature of their assets. They had assets in bonds which used to earn them interest on the bonds, uh, they've now replaced that interest earning asset with a non-interest earning asset. So that might make them willing to lend more money because they suddenly have less income coming in. They're not getting anything from bonds anymore, so they've got to get it from somewhere else. Uh, but that's about the extent of the stimulus that adding to reserves causes. So what you have is people following a textbook model, which is called the money multiplier. 
and that's what they learn in the textbooks about how banks create money. But that model of banking does not include a banking sector. It does not actually look at how banks actually function. And in many ways, the whole idea of the fractional reserve banking model is to be able to blame the government for any crises caused by the financial sector. Because if, if the fractional reserve banking model is correct, then the government controls the amount of money by increasing, cre creating injections of reserves. The government controls the reserve ratio, which controls how much lending occurs. All the banks can do is lend less than that. So if you have any irresponsibility in terms of too much lending, it's all the government's fault. Now, this is a common theme in neoclassical economics. It's completely wrong. And so what I'm doing, what I'm trying to do with my non-orthodox approach to economics is to explain that. So let's just take a look at the, this is this is the typical the, the reason your central bank governor believes what he said to the press is that he swallowed this sort of textbook he would have done as an undergraduate student. This is Gregory Mankiw's macroeconomic textbook. And he says, if the Federal Reserve adds a dollar to the economy and the dollar is held as currency, the supply increases by exactly one dollar. So this is the government creating a money supply. But if that's deposited in a bank and a bank holds only a fraction in reserves, and in the, then the money supply increases by more than one dollar. And this, this is the mindset they have. So as a result, you've got to say, uh, you've got to take account of the Fed's decision about how many dollars to create. So that's the government deciding how much money to create. Banks deciding whether to hold those as reserves or lend them out. And there's the idea of lending from reserves. Um, and households deciding whether to hold their money in terms of cash or demand deposits. So the whole responsibility there falls upon the Federal Reserve. It blames the central banks. And if you look at the Ben Bernanke, who was, of course, the central banker in charge of the Federal Reserve during the 2008 seven, eight financial crisis, he, in looking back at the Great Depression, he blamed the Great Depression on the Federal Reserve. And he said, between mid-1928 and spring of 1931, the Fed did not monetize gold inflows, didn't convert reserves into uh, growth in the money stock, it was actually destabilizing. And then he finally said that um, the government was responsible for the crisis. That was his thinking. And when you look at um, the, the attitude to the, what the government sector does as well, uh, the idea is the government borrows from private bank, uh, borrows from the private sector to finance its deficit. So if the government spends more than it gets back on taxes, it has a government deficit, a budget deficit, and it finds us that by borrowing from the private sector, okay? Um, and then that's the accumulation of private debt and that burdens future generations. So I wanna just take that uh, model I'm just mocking up here live and now look at what is what, what actually enables a, the bank operation to create money. And that is that money is fundamentally the liabilities of the banking sector. You've got cash as well. I've included cash up here in the, in the model as well. So the, the money supply, which is the amount of cash held by the public plus bank deposits held by the public, that's the money supply. Now, how does bank lending create money? Bank lending, lending puts money in deposit accounts and it puts assets on the, banking, on the banking sector's assets as well. So you have an operation which occurs on the liabilities of the banking sector and the assets of the banking sector. And that fundamentally is what's needed to create money. An operation which affects both the asset side of the banks and the liability side of the banks creates money. An operation which transfers from one asset account to another asset account, which is what's going on here, does not create money. Uh, an operation which transfers from one liability account to another, or in this case, and working in terms of short-term uh, equity from deposits to equity, that doesn't create money either. So if you're going to have an operation that creates money, it must be something which affects both the liability side and the asset side of the banking sector. And let's look about a government deficit. And I'll, I'll have a, a government tax, a government spending here. The government spending puts money into deposit accounts and it also increases reserves by the same amount. And that's the simplest proof that a government spending creates money. It's doing exactly the same thing that the lending does, but rather than putting the asset in the loans of the banking sector, it puts the assets in the reserves of the banking sector. Then if you look at taxation,
then that takes money out of in a bank account and it puts <coughs> and takes money out of reserves as well. Okay. So that's fundamentally why loans create money by increasing the loans, which is an asset of the banking sector, and increasing deposits, which is a liability. Government deficit creates money by increasing deposit accounts, same as the loans do, but increasing the reserves rather than the loans of the banking sector. That's the fundamental rule. Now, if you then have, for example, uh, the treasury selling bonds to cover the deficit. So you have the government uh, which se sells bonds to the um, uh, banking sector. So I'm gonna have an increase in sales. So say bonds, from the tre I have bond singular here, uh, from the treasury to the private banks. So the, the bond holdings go up. That is paid for by, it's a, it's a, it's a, a complicated process. You're making it look very simple here because there are what, in America, they're what are called primary dealers who are the initial buyers of bonds and so on. Uh, some of those are banks, some are not. So there's some borrowing going on inside the banking sector to enable this. But fundamentally, the money needed to cover the, if, if, you, if the sale of bonds is equal to the gap difference between spending minus taxation, then what's created money on this side of the banking ledger for the, which is an increase in the assets of the non-bank public has also created an increase in reserves. Now, if you think about the standard situation, which we're no longer in, but the standard situation where reserves earn no interest and bonds do earn positive interest, then banks have had an increase in their reserves courtesy of the deficit. That therefore means they've got money on their asset side, or it's not, it's not strictly money, but I'm gonna call it money now. Um, money is what's happened to the sum over here, but it's finance on this side. It's additional finance created by the deficit. This enables to incur that finance from non-interest earning finance to interest earning finance. But that operation, the sale of bonds, occurs totally on the asset side of the banking sector. It does not occur on the liability side. So therefore that operation is not creating any money. Now, what about if the central bank, we've got it up here, the central bank buys bonds off the, um, off the uh, private banks. That is also something which is doing the opposite. It's taking an interest earning, income earning asset for the banks, which are the bonds, and re replacing them with reserves. Now, the banks will only do that because they're making a profit on the transaction. I'm not showing the trading profit on these lines, but the reason banks will be willing to sell those bonds back to the central bank is the central bank is offering a higher price for those bonds and the banks themselves paid for it. So the banks are making a trading profit out of it. So I'm leaving that out, that particular stage out of it. But also the central bank buying the bonds has nothing to do with creating any additional money over here. If you want to change the amount of money, then what you've got to have is the say the banks sell bonds to non-banks. So in that case, um, what you would have is uh, the bank, the, the non-bank public is going to use its um, deposits to buy treasury bonds from the banks. And that therefore means that the bank has now, of course, got now got less bonds. And you now have got to go and take a look at what's happening for the private bank, the, the uh, non-bank public to see what's happening for them because now they have an additional asset, which I haven't actually recorded here yet. They're not gonna have bonds, which are held by the public. And that transfer of bonds means they've got less cash, but they've now got more income earning assets, which are the bonds. I'm just gonna change this over here to show the uh, spending increases, the assets of the bank of the non-bank public and taxation reduces it. So that's a pretty rapid way of showing an integrated picture of the way that bank lending creates money by increasing the liabilities and increasing the assets and the liabilities of the banking sector. And ditto the bonds, sale of bonds uh, by the private banks to the public reduces the amount of money. But 
the operations we normally focus on and think actually create money do not do so. So the central bank buying bonds off the private banks does not create money. And the sale of treasury bonds to the banking sector does not create money. It's the operation of the deficit itself that does that, just like it's the operation of lending that does the same thing out of private money creation. Now, I did, I know I've done that very quickly. I hope people say it's unspinning too much, but that is a very simple way of showing the way in which banks, banks create money by lending and the government creates money by running a deficit. Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking what you have on the slide then. So what do the textbooks say about uh, uh, deficits? Well, the, the textbook says that the deficit has to be financed by borrowing from the private sector. So what they say, and if I, want to, I can actually probably show that. Let's see how I go and getting it done. I might make a mistake here, but we'll see what happens. Um, so you, if you, the, what the textbook is, says you uh, treasury borrows from non-banks. That's what they think is financing it. So in that case, what that would be is you would have uh, a, a, a loan from the public to the treasury. Um, how do you show that? Well, <laughs> um, the only way I can show that is reserves fall. Otherwise, this doesn't balance. So that's correct, but that's actually reducing the reserves of the banking sector. That's reducing. If I now come and say what's happening on the central bank, and I can bring that in as well, you can see my model is getting slightly complicated here. Let's bring in the central bank now. So call this a central bank. And show what's going on from its point of view. Let's bring the treasury in as well. So bring up the central bank and see its view of things and uh, Let's look at the liabilities first of all, because reserves are a liability of the uh, of the central bank. So I've got this these transactions happening here. What are its this is the central bank equity here. What are its assets? We haven't actually shown any assets. I think of the uh, of the central bank yet, so nothing is turning up to be able to be allocated. Uh, but let's actually add in here one more liability, which is the treasury the treasury's account at the uh, at the central bank because. When the treasury sells bonds, what's going to happen is that it, from selling that bond, those bond, it gets money that turns up in its uh, treasury account. Uh, if the central bank is buying bonds, that actually that's actually coming, uh, that's actually now an asset of the central bank. So when it buys the bonds, they turn up over here. That's operation. Treasury borrows from non-banks. Uh, well, that's that's a minus. So um, uh, let's actually make this a lend to the public from the treasury. So that actually that actually works. Um, but what's actually going on? This let's, let's put spending and taxation here. Spending is going to reduce the amount of money in the treasury account. Taxation is going to increase it. Uh, so I've got that lending operation turning up there. I'm going to continue playing with this later and see what actually happens with the overall process. So the government can take money out of the uh, out of the private sector, but it's equivalent to taxing the private sector. I go back to the non-bank public. That operation I now have to show over here. Um, yeah, but I think Steve, if you had a deficit in the in the in the government first, yeah. So what you're doing is that that increases deposits in the yeah, private that's right. sector. Mm. Okay, and then you withdraw that when you issue a bond. That's what's happening. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so you'd actually be taking money out that way, but you don't need to. You actually look what's going to happen here. This is going to reduce the equity uh, of the uh, private sector, um, and that is fundamentally what was done with war bonds. If you look back and see what would happen during the Second World War. Uh, when massive number of war bonds were sold by the treasury to the public, and you had people like Vera Lynn in England and I don't know Vivian Lee in America getting people to go and buy bonds, they thought they were actually financing the government. No, they weren't. What they were doing is reducing the spending power of the private sector so that more of the um, industrial might of the economy could be directed to building tanks. 
So rather than that financing, it was actually, you know, just doing that live was, was it's a bit, you always wonder how's it going to work out. Um, but this, this is the logic. If you sell bonds to the private sector, the government is not um, borrowing money from them for spending. It's taking money away from them so that that money can be focused on what the government is trying to focus upon, which in the Second World War was the military effort. And with less, less money to spend from the domestic sector, there's less diversion of economic uh, demand uh, from the war effort when that was absolutely critical to do that properly. So the, the government can borrow from the private sector if it wants to, but only if it wants to reduce their spending power. And that's effectively the same thing as taxation, as you can see here. Yeah, so what you're actually saying is then issue, if, if the treasury issue a bond, it's gonna first an issue to the banking sector for the primary dealers, then it decreases their reserves. And if mm -hmm. the banks in that turn sell it to the public, the bank, the, the bank deposits for the buyers in the private sector decrease. Yep. Okay, I, I think I think that's clear enough. Okay, so I'm just going to. This is this is what Minsky is designed to do, by the way, to make it possible to see the logic of all this, because um, as I've, I've already pointed out that mainstream economists have got the logic completely wrong, um, and therefore politicians who've done you know first year economics course, at least in their undergraduate year, have got it wrong as well. And people who go on to do PhDs in economics have also got it wrong. Uh, and I think some monetary reformers have got it wrong as well. And not, not you, you see, obviously, but uh, those, those, this is what Minsky is there to clarify this by saying, this is the accounting, okay? Now there may be, um, there are all sorts of timing elements that I haven't taken into account yet. So maybe when the government uh, thinks it's going to have a major deficit, then it sells bonds in advance of the spending to uh, so that it does this covering operation here uh, before it actually does the spending. But that is arbitrary. If the government didn't actually sell the bonds to the private banks, then what would happen if you look over on the central bank vision over here, it would end up running a negative entry, a negative uh, have a negative balance in its deposit account at the central bank. Now, for most of us, a negative entry in our deposit account means an overdraft account, means overdraft rate of interests, means penalties and controls from the bank on our behaviour. And the unique thing about a central bank and a treasury is the central bank is owned by the treasury. So it can do what it damn well likes, whatever it's legislated to do. Most countries have legislated the treasury can't run an overdraft. Now, in the case of the, the, uh, you know, this, the um, UK central bank, the Bank of England, they overrode that in the beginning of the um, COVID crisis, one of the few things England did right on that particular front. So they allowed the treasury to have a large negative balance in its account, it's effectively have a large overdraft account to enable that to get out there without the needing to go through the uh, procedures of issuing the bonds and so on and, and getting those all passed through parliament and so on, just to get it done quickly. So, but it's entirely a, it, it's entirely a legislative requirement it is not a mathematical or accounting requirement that that be done. And the bank, the government is creating money by running a deficit in the same way that banks create money by lending out more than they get back in repayments. And that's, that's the sort of monetary wisdom we need because this is just wrong, this whole argument. Uh, and that dominates how conventional economists think about banking. It dominates what politicians do. And it means we end up constraining what the government does far more than is necessary. And there's the modern monetary theory argues, and I completely agree with them here, the constraint should be the impact of government behavior, not the possibility of government behavior. Okay, thanks. Okay. And then just to take this with the check credit as you took like, you know, a, a corporation or ourselves with a credit card, we can have a check credit. The thing is that we, that's how we finance when we spend more than we have. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so what you're saying that the government can do that, the government through treasury can do that also with the distinction it doesn't have to pay back. And yeah. when it does that, it, then it's like increasing deposit in the private sector. Yeah. So how is, yeah. how is, how is more money for the private sector bad then? Well, that's actually good for the private sector because the yeah. government runs a deficit. It's, it's putting money in the bank accounts of existing generations. Now think about the inversion this applies here. If we go back and take a look at Mancu's uh, vision here, 
uh, government borrowing reduces national saving and crowds out capital accumulation. We're well, taking a look at it. National saving is the level of deposit accounts. What's the deficit done? It has increased. Yeah, deposits. yeah. It doesn't decrease them. It's the opposite of what the textbook argues. And this is why this is why I want to use the analogy that neoclassical economists are like Ptolemaic astronomers. Because from their point of view, the Earth is the center of the universe and the sun and the moon rotate around us. And all you have to do is look at the sign. You can see that's correct, you know. But we now know with a with the proper understanding of the of the universe that the Earth rotates. And that therefore makes it appear the sun is rising, but the sun relative to our solar system is standing still and we're spinning around it while rotating. And that change of frame of reference totally changes how you think about the skies. And the same thing applies here. Once you have this in your mind, all the concepts of neoclassical economics are similar to Ptolemaic astronomy. Yeah, and these are plausible, they're wrong. So what you're saying, they got almost everything inverted. Is that yeah. what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so, what we're simply saying, let's get it right way around. Let's actually realize that the sun is the center of the solar system. Yeah. So, and in that sense, that, and the monetary system is the center of capitalism. And if you've got your monetary model wrong, the rest of your model is almost bound to be totally useless. So the neoclassical vision, which is the non-monetary bar division of the world, uh, that alone is a reason to throw it out. Yeah, but it also must have you know, terrible consequences for society. Because what we do is we, we limit how much of this, the, 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 the deficit money creation goes on. And if you do that, that then is encouraging people to borrow more money from the banks. Because if government happens to run a surplus, so if the spending is less than taxation, then you're reducing the amount of money in people's deposit accounts. Now, when you look at what the, the situation is for the, the aggregate situation for the non-bank public, this is where this first row becomes important because the banking sector, to become a bank, you must have positive equity. One of the first issues in forming a bank is to get people to put aside money uh, so the bank starts with a positive equity base. Now, again, I said I'm leaving out the existence of assets which are not a liability for somebody else. So, But if you look at it in terms of the banks borrowing money from others or uh, people converting, uh, their, uh, handing their deposits over to the bank to enable it to form an equity base, that the banking sector must have positive equity. Therefore, the rest of the economy is in negative equity to precisely the same sum that the banking sector is in positive equity. So if you look at the non-bank public, and that in, the non-bank public includes the government, then if the banks are positive equity plus 30, the rest is in negative equity and minus 30. Now, if the government then tries to increase its own equity, so you're looking at the government versus the, as, as part of the non-bank public plus the uh, non-bank public itself, if the government's trying to increase its equity, then it's reducing the equity of the non-bank public. So by running a surplus, the government is taking money out of the bank accounts of the private sector. Now, what the private sector will do, and we saw this back in the 1920s when the government ran in America, ran a 1% of GDP surplus per year, as the government was therefore reducing bank deposits by the equivalent of 1% of GDP per year, the private sector was borrowing from banks to the tune of 5% per year. So we had a wonderful speculative bubble in the 1920s, first of all in real estate, as Richard Vague's brilliant book, um, a Brief History of Doom explains very well. I didn't realise this myself until I read Richard's book that the 1920s began with a real estate bubble. Um, and then they got into the share market and borrowed a huge amount of money to speculate on shares. And the, the scale of that borrowing still makes me just shake in awe. At the beginning of the 1920s, margin debt, which is debt you borrowed from a broker to finance buying shares, was 1% of GDP. At the end of the 1920s, it was 12% of GDP. So the huge increase we saw in the Dow Jones was all driven by borrowed money. And of course, when the margin calls occurred, the whole thing collapsed. So the government running a surplus actually encourages the private sector to speculate. And that's the last thing we want them to do. I'd rather have them innovate than speculate and gamble. And the impact of that is often negative and causes a financial crisis after. So in many ways, the surplus the government ran during the 1920s encourage the private sector to run its own deficit with its banking sector, borrowing more than it was taking, you know, paying back in debt, increasing its liabilities to the banking sector. 
levering up financial assets, looking like they were coming out ahead, and then the Great Gatsby collapsed and we had the depression of the 1930s. So what, what you're saying then is that uh, uh, government surpluses actually uh, increases leverage in the private sector. It encourages right. an increase in leverage, it reduces the amount of money. It's again, it's the exact opposite of what Mankey was saying here. Yeah, I, I rather, get it. I, yeah, I get rather, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I get it also. But when you take away deposits from people, the deposit, you know, the, 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 the relation between uh, debt and deposits will, will uh, uh, increase, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it means that, that in normal cases, this will uh, increase financial instability, which is the opposite that they say they want to do. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, could we just do a quick sum summary on that if you if you if you let me get the screen Steve. Yeah, sure. Let me see if I succeed to do it properly this time. Oh, yeah. Let's see if it goes here. Yeah. So let's see you took money creation by banks then. Can you see I'm not me? Share, I'm not sharing your, you're not seeing your screen right now. Oh, you're I'm kidding me. It's no, no, I've got it. I've got it. Pardon me. My mistake. I was on the wrong right. I'm seeing your screen. Yes, you're, you're fine. Keep going. You're just pulling my leg all the time. Is that something? Sorry, mate. Also, Sorry. Also, also can't it's late at night over here and soon. <laughs> hey, I've, I've got an earache. You know, I'm a bit of a, I'm a hampered man tonight. Okay. Anyway, the summary, money creation by banks is that banks create money by indebting the public. That's what they mm -hmm. do. That's, that's, that's just double entry bookkeeping that you showed us, okay? And the fourth mm -hmm. theory that you showed us was loanable funds. It means that, you know, they're just intermediaries. And that was actually what Ben Anke said also, right? And then you had fractal reserve banking that the central bank controls the, the amount, the money supply just by adding or withdrawing uh, reserves from the banking sector, mm. which they actually say that they do in the QEs today. Okay. And then they, mm -hmm. so, so that's faulty theory. A money creation by government is government creates money through spending. So when, when they pay people to do things, it's actually money into deposit accounts. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that is deficit for private sector and that forces higher private debt. Deficit is a surplus for private sector enhances equity, right? And, and mm -hmm. which should mean that it uh, uh, should enhance uh, financial stability also then. Uh, if you don't get crazy about it. Okay. Government bond is an asset swap for banks. It, it swap reserves to bonds. And the fourth yep. theory here is crowding out, as you said, it's like, because I think that Mankin, the textbook said that if you take away money from the private sector, you know, that will enhance competition. It will be more expensive for private sector to, to borrow from others with money. But actually, it's the other way around. So, private, so, so <laughs> deficit from government is actually crowding in. Exactly, exactly. And, In fact, I must acknowledge an old friend of mine uh, since deceased Colm Kearney, uh, who actually made that phrase that when he did the statistics on, uh, he's a top class econometrician, when he did the stats on the, when the crowding out argument was so popular, what he found was crowding in. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. Could you, could you send that link later on sometimes, if you remember, otherwise I remind yeah. you. you. Remind me, you know what I'm like, Chrissy, <laughs> I'll forget. Thanks. Okay. And um, then they also say that debt, you know, is created by deficit and that's a debt for future generation. It has to be paid back. And, the, and what you show is now why it doesn't have to be paid back because paid back means that we're going to decrease your deposits. In fact, there's actually interesting. I'm going to show one, uh, one little try to be to take the screen back from you again. If you okay. um, take okay. it over and I'll just go for mine. Thank you. Okay. Share my screen. Okay. This is something, this is my uh, next book. Uh, called a new economics uh, a, a manifesto and what i'm doing here is looking at the government surplus in america between 1900 and, and uh, well actually the whole of the last uh, uh, 120 years and you see anywhere above this red line is a surplus and anywhere below is a deficit and you can see that the only sustained period of surplus for the american government when you're running at roughly one percent of gdp was the 1920s now then you had the, the crash of the 1930s uh, and then the government runs a deficit then. 
And then, of course, during the Second World War, the blue line shows government debt as percentage of GDP. There's a huge increase in government debt from 30 percent of GDP at the, at the 1942, this is America's data, to 110 percent by 1945. And if you take the conventional argument, oh, that's a terrible burden on the private sector, and that's going to have to be paid for by future generations. So here was the future generation who suffered so badly from the borrowing during the Second World War. The answer, people watching the screen, most of you, baby boomers. You're the most spoiled generation in the history of humanity, because that was a huge increase in government creation of money. And if you look at the performance of the economy across that period, we had the best time going, what's called the golden age of capitalism, a growth rate that averaged four and a quarter percent, roughly four and a fifth percent of GDP uh, per annum versus two point, um, um, if you look at the, 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 the whole period of the post-war period, right up to 19 to 2020, 2.58, uh, low un lower unemployment, lower inflation, um, and in fact, a smaller deficit than we've faced on the average, uh, a fallen level of, of, of government debt, but an increase in private debt. Okay, so we've got ourselves back on the speculative engine once more. But this, if the neoclassicals were right, this huge increase in government debt should have burdened the future generation. And the future generation should have been really angry at the Second World War troops. The future generation that suffered from this were the baby boomers. So again, the whole view is upside down as to what reality uh, actually turns out to be. Okay, great. <clears throat> I, I'll, I'll continue to getting back to, I'm gonna get back to share yep. screen. And uh, now you have to wait one minute before you say that you don't see anything. Sorry about that. Here we go. You have to res Let me see, does happen something here? Uh, let me see. You see me, right? Yep, yep, see you, yep. Okay. So if you get back to this then. So this was a press conference with Governor Stefan Ingves on the occasion of the executive board's decision to lend up to 500 billion to companies via the banks. So what's going on here? What, what do they believe in then? Well, what they should have done is lend to the, they're saying they shouldn't lend via the banks, they should have lent directly to the firms. But again, it's possible for the central bank to buy uh, bonds off off the, off the um, uh, private, private corporations. Uh, there are various controls of how much they can do of that, legal, legal controls. But if the central bank had bought bonds, newly issued bonds directly off private, uh, private corporations, they would have transferred those pieces of paper created by the corporate sector into money. Yeah, that could uh, be the deposit. But in this case, yeah. when they go through the banks, they, so what are they saying? They're gonna borrow reserves to, to... Well, if, you, if, if you take a look at your next slide of course okay which we've already seen just go back to your next slide yeah he thought that when it buys the securities from the banks they're created into converted into reserves and new money uh, and that means they have a large surplus which they can lend out so that's he's caught up in the fractional reserve banking model which is not amazing he did an economics degree okay so you, you're saying that they are basing lots of their uh, interventions on, and, and what they're doing on fractional reserve banking. That's what they believe. And that's, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm lucky I managed to break away from that belief system uh, when I was 18. Uh, so I had 50 years of, of being critical of that way of thinking. And then when I, we, we did this, but what, I've, what I've put forward is a, is, a, is a range of ideas that have come out of a whole number of different economists before me. So Basil Moore in particular, uh, a Canadian uh, non-orthodox economist who became aware of endogenous money, the fact the argument the banks create money through interaction with Paul Davidson, who's a post-Keynesian economist when he was at Cambridge on sabbatical. And then Basil developed the theory of endogenous money, the, mo the modern theory. Uh, An Italian economist, Augusto Graziani, explained that transactions are we, we have a barter vision, again, coming out of neoclassical textbooks, that, that uh, every transaction involves two people with two commodities trying to work out a relative price. So one person has got pigs, the other person has got guns. They try to work out a relative price between the two. And Graziani said, in modern economy, you have one agent trying to sell something, like, for example, pigs, another agent wanting to buy it, and the transaction is affected by the buyer Make, telling a bank to transfer money from its account to the seller's account. And so transactions are three-sided. 
a bank, a buyer and a seller, one commodity, and it's a monetary transaction. And those, that's the vision that I'm putting forward here. And then Hyman Minsky, of course, explained the role of government, of, of uh, private money creation in causing bubbles and crashes. And that's another thing we can talk about later in the talk tonight. Okay, thanks. Do you think we could jump then to private debt uh, and yep. look at the other consequences with private debt and, and credit? Yep, I'll just have to go forward a bit on my presentation here. So just give me a chance to do that. You, I'll say we are at the screen at the moment. I want to go past this, um, all the arguments about how banks operate with the near classes was completely wrong. Okay, now let's go back and I'll share my screen once more. And this is the long term view of the level of private debt in America uh, since the 1830s, right through, through to today. Uh, just asking people is, is I've got the, the, the zoom screen over here, it's obscuring part of the text, I'll just move it up a bit. Okay, if you can now see the entire graph, this is the long term history of private debt in America. And what you see is a period of if there's a crash, and after every crash, there's another period of accelerating debt until we have something like a Great Depression when it crashes once more, and then another boom and bust. And here we are now with this rising level of private debt during the crisis caused by COVID. So that's the long term history of private debt in America. And I'll just actually go to presentation mode here now. All right. And that's the very, it's one of the variables neoclassical economics tells you not to worry about. In the loanable funds model, which we haven't actually discussed, but the model they have of what banks do or where they see banks as intermediaries, the level of private debt doesn't matter. It's not an important issue in macroeconomics. And if they were correct, it'd be true. Now, this is the, what I've shown you that beforehand is the level of debt. This is the rate of change of debt. So this is looking at the change in debt and dividing it by GDP. And what do you know? Very negative, this is the, anything above the blue line is rising, rise, positive credit, therefore rising private debt. Anything below is negative credit, therefore falling private debt. There's the Great Depression. There's the Great Recession, which is the Americans call the 2007 crisis. And there is an event called the Panic of 1837. And all of those major crises in capitalism occur with a period of negative private debt. Now, what I'm looking at here is looking at the correlation of employment to credit. So this is now looking at the American data from 1890 forward, which is when I have data on unemployment. And you find a huge plunge into negative credit here, occurring at the same time as a huge plunge in employment. And the same thing in the, 19, in the uh, uh, 2007 crisis. The correlation between credit and, un and employment during periods like this is about minus 0.9 as close as you can get to one uh, out of, e out of uh, economic data. So credit drives employment, credit is the driving factor in economic activity. And that's what's left out of their, their thinking. If we have a high level of debt, this is looking at the, the data for the 1930s. Plunge in credit, plunge in the employment rate. Looking at the same thing in, the, in 2000 and, uh, 1992, 2010 or 14, the same story, an enormous correlation between credit and the level of employment. Credit goes up, so does employment. Credit goes down, so does employment. So this is what's being left out of mainstream economic thinking. And it's huge. Uh, uh, this is not even a model. Okay, This is just saying this is a correlation that according to conventional economics should be no, not significantly different to zero. Well, it's a long way different to zero. This is what they're ignoring. It's as big as ignoring you know, the structure of the solar system in the way that the, um, the, post, the, the, the atomic uh, astronomers used to work. So the neoclassicals are wrong about how banks work. They're wrong about the macroeconomic impact of private debt. Could they be right about government debt? Well, I've been through that as well. So I'll, I'll stop at that point on the private debt. But what I want to show you now quickly is a package I'm going to be releasing to the public on my birthday, is it March 28th? This is called Ravel. And what this lets me do is this, this is a database sitting on top of Minsky. And so what I've shown you is the American data. That's what you're looking here at the moment. This is the Bank of International Settlements uh, database on private debt. Uh, I take the change in private debt to get the level of credit, divide that by GDP, and I've got the credit data, which you saw me graphing a moment ago on the, um, 
uh, on the previous set of slides, but that's just the United States. Uh, but you can see huge increase in private debt and then the plunge of the, the, the recession. What about the UK? Similar sort of data for the UK. Okay. Let's go and find Sweden. Okay. Um, so the ups and downs of the, of the uh, financial system, they're the best example actually is Spain. That's my favourite. Uh, because we know what a, a boom and bust Spain went through. Credit in Spain hit over 35% of GDP during the boom. It hit almost minus 20% during the slump. That's a 50% of GDP turnaround in demand created by credit. And that's this is left out of the mainstream thinking. They don't even look at this data. Even though the statisticians collect it, that's what they're ignoring. So what I'm doing with Ravel, which is that I'll be giving away to my uh, Patreon supporters uh, next week, is actually next Sunday, um, uh, this, this enables people to see this for themselves and analyze it for themselves, as well as applying the software to, um, to other issues if they so wish. Okay. I was just thinking, are you, are you gonna show the picture of uh, the uh, uh, income distribution that you made last time? Um, good question. <laughs> I'm afraid I haven't prepared all that. Well, I, mean, I was dragged out shopping today, so I haven't had a chance to really, uh, uh, distribution of income. Did I do that? Ah, okay. Yes. I know what you're talking about now. Okay. Let's take a look at that. That is looking at the, um, let's go up and bring this over here. I'll just go back and share my screen again. Okay. What that was about was doing a general model of the role of credit in a capitalist economy. Uh, and this is the work that Hyman Minsky first originated. Hyman Minsky was the one who argued what he called the financial instability hypothesis. And so the ups and downs of the uh, economy are largely driven by the ups and downs of the monetary system, where uh, firms will borrow money during a boom, which finances the boom itself. But the boom therefore causes over time an increase in amount of money going to wages and increase the amount of money going to raw materials producers. And that at the peak of the boom, that means that the level of profit is less than capitalists want. So they will therefore try to pay their debt down and, and wages will be cut as well. Uh, and what will then to happen over time is, and Minsky wasn't aware of this, this is something that came out of my mathematical modeling, is that that will tend to mean that the distribution of income shifts away from workers and towards bankers. If you think about the capitalism as a, as a three class system, workers, bankers and capitalists uh, in this model and in roughly speaking in the real world, capitalists are driven by the rate of profit. There's some rate of profit that will mean that they invest what they earn in profits. And then above that rate of profit, they'll invest more. So they have to borrow money below that level of uh, profit. They'll invest less so they can pay their debt off. Uh, but if there's two social classes that get the residual of the income in the economy, so workers plus bankers, it doesn't really matter to capitalists whether bankers are getting more money or workers are getting more money. They're just looking at their amount of money. Now, if the amount of debt in the economy, private debt is rising over time, then the amount of money going to workers can be falling and it won't affect capitalists at all. And this is what comes out of the model that I did of Minsky's um, financial instability hypothesis. So I'll quickly just take you through it. You start with the level of capital, uh, capital stock, which produces output, which tells you how many workers you need to hire, which gives you an employment rate, uh, which will give you a rate of change of wages, which will then give you the wages bill. And if you subtract wages and interest payments from GDP, you get gross profits. That net profit then determines the investment rate, or the rate of profit, pardon me, which then determines how much investment that occurs uh, which then determines how much capital you've got minus depreciation. That's just a causal loop between the two. And if I simulate this system, and it's fundamentally I can derive this from economic definitions. I don't need even to talk about a, a flowchart model here. What you have is a phenomenon that turns up in the model over time that the amount going to, pro to capitalists is remaining roughly constant. The amount going to workers is trending down in a cyclical fashion. The amount going to bankers is rising. And for a while, the cycles start to diminish. So if you look at the growth rate, there's like booms and busts in the economy, the cycles are getting smaller. And this is what was happening in the global economy prior to 2007, what neoclassical economists called the great moderation. 
So there were diminishing cycles and they thought that was because of their good management of the economy. And then you keep on going and what happens after a while, those cycles start to get larger. Now, this is something which is beyond their understanding because they don't work in non-equilibrium terms. They don't include money. Uh, they don't understand complex systems. Uh, but what's going on here is a transition from a period of stable behavior into chaos. And that's, this is to me is the, is the core model of a capitalist economy that, and this is what we saw in capitalism itself. And I built this model back in 1992, which is before neoclassical economists christened this trend here, the great moderation before they took credit for it. And so my, my first discovery of this model, when I built it in 92, my conclusion was actually one of my, one of my econometrics lecturers put it brilliantly. He said, Steve, if you've identified anything that exists in real capitalism, we're in deep, deep trouble. And that's indeed what happened. The breakdown of the economy driven by too much private debt. So this is a combination of Minsky's financial instability hypothesis and the, uh, a complex systems view of the world. This is the sort of view we need to have to understand what's actually going on in capitalism. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'll try to do like this then again. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> God. No, it's not happening. Try again. You're, you're muted, you see? You must have muted yourself by accident. There you go. No, I got dumped. <laughs> Oh, I'll try again. No, no, yeah, yeah, I'm going to try. I'll, uh, it seems like um, my computer doesn't like me anymore. And Don's question, yes, they do create the money that drives the economy. So let's okay. see. Yep. So this is the so this is the point, actually. Well, if you look at income distribution here, which is at yellow, okay. Mm. So what you're saying is that workers get less and less and less which means that unemployment will increase and also that wages rel relatively speaking will be lower banks or financial sector get see it more but corporations are happy where they are and if they want to increase their profits it means they're gonna they, they, they need to decrease the wage distribution right yeah but there's a limit to that you get to the point where the, the drop in wages is not sufficient to offset the rise in interest payments on debt and yeah. you finally get a breakdown. Yeah, yeah, you get to get the breakdown, absolutely. But you get the breakdown in corporations too. But who gonna who are they gonna sell to? Because this means that aggregate demand's gonna decrease too. Exactly, which is what we saw happening in uh, two thousand and seven. Yeah, yeah, okay. And then when we look at debt versus profit, now we can see, okay, this is what you saw here. Well, okay, it will be a bit sluggish, but it's still uh, 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 okay for the corporations. So you know, so they are not that concerned but then debt versus wages here we can then see that okay wages decrease it's quite amazing actually i mean i think i think most people should be concerned about that when you're thinking about private debt maybe you're not so concerned about it you know just because well it's debt and you know my my our assets is big enough or whatever but this takes us to a, a breaking point that's what you're saying here that's the problem we, we have a, a, a when the level of private debt can overwhelm the prepayment capacity of the economy. Yeah. Uh, you have a series of what we call a Minsky moment uh, is to me and this model, uh, a point where the accumulation of debt gets to be so great that the, the decline in wages share is no longer sufficient to offset the increase in payments required to the bankers for the additional level of debt. And then capitalists do start to suffer. So if I keep that model going for long enough, you finally see a complete collapse in capitalist profit uh, rather than the um, cycling around the same level. Yeah. And if, if I was looking at your, your um, credit and debt uh, 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 graphs that you showed, and if I look at this, it also says that even if you stabi st stabilize uh, uh, credit or, or indebtedness, it means stagnation then, right? Uh, credit is, is, and this is one point that uh, is made very well by Richard Vague in the brief history of doom. Credit has played a creative role in the formation of capitalism. When you look at credit being provided to uh, railways back in the 19th century, that was a major way in which railroads were financed. Equally, 
the telecommunications boom in the 1990s, a lot of that was debt financed as well. So there's a creative role for private debt, but you can't let it overwhelm the economy. Uh, and, and that's what we've done. We've let the level of debt overwhelm the economy because according to neoclassical economists, it doesn't matter. And what they're saying is don't look at one of the most important indicators of the health of a capitalist economy. It'll all be fine if you don't look at it, which is not true, as we found out in 2007. So uh, I, I, want, I want to see credit playing a role in the capitalist economy uh, because I want, you know, I understand uh, if you have bankers, which as Richard Werner says, bankers should be servants of the industrial sector and you should have banks which are local and know their local capitalists and so on. That sort of lending I want to promote. But the sort of lending we've been going to as banks have aggregated and you've had these giant agglomerations formed is all this asset-based lending, lending to buy financial assets and based on, on asset valuations rather than adding a new industrial capacity to capitalism. So we need to get them back, back into their boxes and keep them there. And of course, they will always want to get out of the boxes because they make money themselves individually. Again, as Richard explains very well, uh, the more debt they create during a bubble, the more they get paid. Yeah. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> Shall we try to do a bit of a summary again then on, that, on private mm -hmm. debt? Yep. Okay. So what you say in credit drives aggregated demand. If it's negative, it means that we're getting in, into problem. And if it goes up, it, uh, it increases uh, uh, aggregate demand. Mm -hmm. Okay, and when high private debt, then it's a high correlation. It means that it follows quite tightly. Yep. And increase in debt decreases wages and uh, uh, increases uh, income share to financial institutions. And it drives employment, and it means that if the debt gets, when it gets higher and higher, we get lower and lower employment, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we get asset price inflation, and it causes financial crisis. And then you say they don't care about this in neoclassical economics. They leave it out completely. They they have what they call the efficient markets hypothesis, and that's one of the many pieces of absolute garbage uh, that the neoclassical economists have forced upon the world. Um, again, never, never trust a textbook, never trust an economics textbook. Okay. You can trust a mathematics textbook. You can trust a physics textbook, chemistry, um, even sociology. You cannot trust an economics textbook. And, uh, my favorite recent example of that is that a guy called Alan Blinder, who was a, a deputy president of the, uh, Federal Reserve at one stage and was on uh, a president of the American Economic Association or vice president. So high ranking neoclassical economists did a study in 1990, the 1990s, published in 1998, of the cost structure of firms. He found that the cost structure of firms was nothing like um, what he wrote taught in his textbook. What happened in his 2006 version of the textbook? He ignored his own research. He effectively lied about his own research to keep with the model. So textbooks are completely untrustworthy. And the trouble is because they're plausible, because their model is plausible, students fall for it. And what it teaches them is, is to me, a lot of the appeal of neoclassical economics is it describes a, a perfect system in the sense that everybody gets paid what they, um, what they are worth. Okay, you get you in your marginal products and it reaches equilibrium. Now the real world, sorry, neither of those apply. You get what you, what you, what you, what you get depends on where you are in a social hierarchy depends on your relative power and the system is non-equilibrium and prone to crises and crashes, which they completely ignore until they happen. And then they're forced to backtrack and do something about it. Hmm. Okay. To, to jump further, uh, I, I think you already went through that. What happens if increase or decrease government spending? Mm -hmm. So let's just look at an example then to see, I, I hope this makes sense. If not, uh, uh, my bad. Okay. <laughs> it, this, Give me a this second. Just, to, just, I'm just actually saving my 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 bank demo a moment ago. Just so I've just done that. Okay. Okay. Keep going. Yep. Yeah. This, this was the governor of the Riggs Bank to have the presentation at the finance committee, uh, uh, February the second, and he he said that more measures are needed to reduce the risk of house household indebtedness. Actually, they recognize it somehow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's, it's quite interesting to see if you look at the left picture here first, you see 
this is household debt 1995 and this is business debt the next one 54 percent uh, 1995 and then you have public debt uh, like the government uh, government debt mm. which is 79 percent then if you could fast track fast track forward to 2019 suddenly households are 92 percent of gdp mm. Or total, but but you know total loans uh, uh, indebtedness is two hundred percent, and then seventy five and thirty five. So, is this exactly what you said in Minsky? Yep. Because the public debt decreases quite a lot; it's more than half. Yep. And the dub it's doubled actually on that side. Yep. And the funny thing, or funny, I don't know, but the, which is encouraging, I would say, he says that over the past twenty five years, households, households in Sweden have increased their indebtedness while public indebtedness has decreased. So apparently he thinks there is a connection. Right? Oh, there's, there's, there's a causal role between the two because, again, the government paying its debt down will in, in, end up frequently causing the private sector debt levels to rise when two reasons, either the private sector goes and borrows or GDP grows more slowly and therefore the debt ratio rises. Yeah, okay, yeah. But anyway, we, we could see there is some kind of trade-off on this one. Hmm. So let's see what is the con what what is the conclusion of what you said so far. If I try to make it very easy, so policy decisions are made on forty theories. That, that that's mm -hmm. what you're showing on your lecture today, right? Yep. Okay. And government should normally run a deficit. Yep. Okay. So do we need to spend like one hour and twenty minutes to get to that conclusion? Well, it's only taken one hour and 20 minutes when it's taken neoclassical <laughs> economists 60 years to come up with total bullshit. So th this is why I'm saying we need a new way of thinking. We need a new paradigm. And Minsky has been designed to make it easy to see this. Uh, people make all sorts of mistakes because they don't understand double entry bookkeeping. And I might add, I was in that camp before I invented Minsky uh, because I thought that repayment of debt did not destroy money. It seemed to me ridiculous that banks would let destroy something they'd created. So my not 2011 debunking economics rubbishes that to some extent and works just entirely in the cash model uh, with no with loans, but all everything being in cash terms. And when I after I built Minsky, I realized I was wrong. Okay, repayment destroys money in the same way that loans create money. And you if you don't have a double entry bookkeeping understanding of money, you are going to be wrong. And that is the state of mainstream economics, unfortunately. Yeah. So I actually we are back to this. You used to say, you, now you have showed us exactly the same thing as you used to uh, predict the Great Recession. Mm -hmm. And that you have done now is built a system in Minsky on that. And that is what you've been working on, the, these two books and then the book that you showed us, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. I just wanted to, to, to get back to that point. Uh, before we go to Q&As, uh, I'm I think I'm going to skip uh, thoughts about monetary policy because it's been quite long, but I just mm. want to present another guy. I thought... Yeah, good old Michael. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know him. So we're going to have him on uh, Tuesday, April 6th, 7 p.m. Central Eastern Time, which means the time we have in Stockholm. And he also says something that you said uh, in Minsky today, that debts can't be paid, won't be paid, right? Mm, it's a great line, yeah. Yeah. Would you like, would you care to say a few words about Michael? Yeah, well, Michael and I met, uh, I think, in about 2008 or nine at the Levy Institute uh, seminars. We've been friends ever since then because we realized that we, he has a very verbal approach to a variable and historical approach. I've got a very mathematical approach. We realized we were absolutely consonant in our own thinking. And there was one very funny incident where um, when I was still refining my ideas on this, uh, Michael came to my hotel in the States and we're talking away in my room discussing this stuff. And he said, uh, what is aggregate demand? And I said, it's GDP plus change in debt. And he said, why can't other people see that? Uh, now, in fact, I was slightly wrong. It's not GDP, it's turnover of existing money plus, plus new debt, which is what I've refined my logic to. And I can now make that point mathematically very, uh, very completely. But Michael had the same intuition that I had, that credit had to play a major role in aggregate demand. And in fact, that even sets us apart from other non-Orthodox economists, some of whom have told me that people buy their houses out of their savings, for example, um, which is wrong. They buy it out of credit. 
So we both understood the role of credit. Michael has a remarkable history. At the same time that I met him in 2008 or nine, uh, I was, we, we went for a walk with, our, with a, a friend and my then girlfriend off towards uh, the banks of the um, Hudson River, as it happens, because we were actually, I think it's that, is it the Hudson River that runs through uh, New York? Oh, don't it ask is. me, sorry. I think, I think it is, I think it is, yeah. Off to the banks of the Hudson, with Hudson, and uh, my girlfriend and uh, is chatting with Michael and I was with, the, with our mutual friend, and I turned back to see her bowing down towards Michael. And then I caught up to her and said, what's going on here? And she said, guess who Michael's godfather is? I said, well, duh, hard to work that out. And she said, Leon Trotsky. So Michael's father was the leader of the Trotskyist movement in, I think it's in Michigan, uh, at the time when it was actually the state was run by the Trotskyists and Leon Trotsky on escape from Russia, uh, Minneapolis, thank you, Chester, from Minneapolis, uh, on escape from Minneapolis, went down to Mexico where he was uh, shortly afterwards uh, bequeathed a, uh, an ice pick to the skull and killed by an agent of Stalin. But Michael, he was literally there at Michael's birth. So Michael's got a remarkable history, um, entirely relevant, but it's good fun. Um, and he has been a historian of economic thought, uh, plus also a, a person who's looked at the archaeological record. And the archae yeah, is ext extremely fascinating autobiography. His, his, um, he, he, was, uh, he wasn't doing necessarily directly doing the digs, but interpreting what was coming out of ancient Samaria, we found, he found that credit instruments existed rather than barter. Okay, they were the, church, the religious institution, which was a sort of combined religious and state entity, was the one that kept the records of everybody's obligations to other people. And there were regular jubilees as well. And the jubilees uh, actually were often forgiving debts that people accumulated in mead halls and drinking halls. Um, uh, but if that debt wasn't written off, people would become debt slaves. As debt slaves, they'd work on the land of the, land of the landowner, the mead hall owner. Uh, and then the army would lose potential recruits. So the army uh, became weakened against potential external foes, which is one reason why the, the royalties, uh, the, 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 the uh, emperor uh, instituted a jubilee to write off household debt and enable the army to be rebuilt and so on. And you can, you can see a lot of the history of the rise and fall of ancient civilizations coming out of whether they abolished debt or not at the behest of people who were debts, effectively debt slaves to the owners of, of land and the owners of money. And uh, we, we have been in the same situation. We think we're smarter than those people 5,000 years ago, uh, but in fact, we're not because they understood the role of debt and credit and we don't. Thanks, that was a good introduction because that's exactly what he's gonna talk on about. His, yeah, he will talk about history of debt, money and power struggles, what you talked about right here. Connect, uh, you know, power struggles connected to this with debt. Uh, and he gives an excellent understanding of what has been going on for thousands of years and still actually is. Yeah, so that's what you're going to be talking about. So I just posted a link in the, in the, in the chat. So those of you who want to uh, enroll already and say that you would like to come, please use it. And we're going to send it out later on to all who were here anyway. But we are really, really happy to have uh, uh, Michael coming here and, and talk. And he is actually... Uh, enjoyable to listen to, I have to say. He's Beautiful really, fun. really good talker and very, yes. very knowledgeable. Yeah, because it was 40 years he did his study for with quite a lot of other uh, uh, experts in these things around the world that he was leading. So, I mean, uh, it's, it's quite worth to come. So, please, everybody here, join us. Okay, thanks, Steve, for that. Then we go over to questions, and I'm going to see if we can make this uh, kind of... Uh, in a good way. I need to do a few things here. Mm. I'm gonna unmute. So if people just, uh, please raise up your hand and say if you have a question to Steve right now from what we went through and we take those questions. I'm scrolling. Do you guys know how to raise your hand on this uh, Zoom thingy? And John's oh, waving his hand one. there. Yeah, Jeff, please. Can you unmute yourself, <clears throat> Jeff, and take a question? Hi, Steve. Hi, Jeff. 
Anyways, so I would like to start. Um, I have great respect for Steve and the work he's done to uh, challenge mainstream uh, economic fallacies. However, in this case, I object to Steve's characterization that the deficit creates money uh, because it is not an accurate uh, reflection of what actually occurs when governments finance their deficits. So some of the things he does is he doesn't include all the transactions that occur and I'll just speak for Canada because I'm most familiar with that particular setup, is the Consolidated Revenue Fund, which is the account where all money goes through that fund to the, to the government. So I posed a bunch of links um, in the chat where you can access this information and it's downloaded daily. So it, it shows all the revenue flows coming in and all the revenue flows going out. So I challenge anybody that can interpret that spending occurs first um, out of that data. Uh, there's also another uh, document that I forwarded to you guys. I just replied with the email because like I'm a total spaz with this iPad thing. Um, but anyways, Steve can comment further on what I've just said, but I'd like you guys to have that document about how governments manage cash balances uh, because it's an excellent document. And again, it asserts what, what I'm saying, is that Steve is actually the one who's got this backwards. Over to you, Steve. Uh, it comes down to accounting, Jeff, and this is where we're gonna continue disagreeing. Uh, and that <laughs> is that if the government is, if you, you have to show me an operation by the government that accesses the liability side of the private banks as well as the asset side, that is actually fundamental to the government creating money. Now, if you can't show that, then all you're showing me is the timing sequences involved. So for example, if the government in 2020 decides it's gonna run, I'd say in Australian case, what about a 200 billion Australian dollar deficit, then it will quite probably issue bills of worth $200 billion worth and sell those into the, uh, into the asset markets before it does the spending. But that will mean that reserves, which are on the asset side of the banking sector system, get converted into bonds, which are also on the asset side of the banking sector system. Then the bank will do this, government will do the spending after that, but the spending is the only thing that occurs on both the asset side and the liability side. So I can take all the timing issues you make, I can include those in my models when I make them more elaborate. It will not change the reality that the only things that create money are operations that occur on both the asset and the liability side of the banking sector. Now, if you can prove that with Minsky, then you can shut me up. If you can't, then I'm going to say, Jeff, you're in the same situation I was 10 years ago of not understanding it, of repayment debt that destroys money. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. You've got to listen to, let to me, you can reply below to let people say thing after you, mate, but go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So anyways, Minsky is not required and the timing is critical. <laughs> That's what neoclassical economists think. <laughs> Anyways, that's what I'm saying. Minsky's not required. I've, like I said, I've got, there's two links. There's the link to the consolidated revenue fund. So you haven't included uh, that in your modeling and that is critical. And also the time delays between the inflows and the outflows, that is critical because that determines if the government spends before it actually has funds or whether it happens simultaneously. It, 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 the timing is one issue, but the other is, is it happening on the assets and the liability side of the banking sector? And if it isn't happening on both sides, then the timing is irrelevant. Yeah, I disagree with that, but no, I know let you do. somebody else I, take the question. We're going to do okay. this further because. Yep. All right. Yep. Okay. okay. Thanks, Jeff. So anybody else want to? Okay. We have Don here. Don, you raised your hand. You want to go? I'm trying to unmute. I'm trying to unmute. I've unmuted. You have so, unmuted, yeah. Uh, Steve, I like your Ravel software. It looks tremendous. You started looking at real world data. Could you comment on the huge amount of quote unquote savings there are in countries' economies that are going to um, uh, allow us to recover, quote unquote, far more quickly and easily than anybody is uh, is uh, is is expecting. 
So it, I mean, it looks. If you listen to commentators, it looks like it looks like everything's going to be cool because or fine because um, we're going to get all this pent up savings being spent. Yeah, I've, I've seen that, and actually, you know, I'll, I'll do a bit of sharing of my screen again because, again, as you say, data is. Uh, if you don't look at the data, you don't know what's going on. Um, and so what, what, what people are making that claim about are, are looking at the, the, the national accounting definition of savings. So the national accounting definition of savings is as output minus consumption. That is defined to be savings. And it's also defined to be investment. So you get the savings is equal to investment argument coming out of it. That is all looking at the national accounts. Um, now the national, and this is also involved in the MMT's calculations too, by the way, uh, the national accounts are not, um, not, not saving as we think about it ourselves. What we think about as savings is increasing the amount of money in our bank accounts. Now, when you look at what's happening in people's bank accounts, that's the red line here. This is the level of private debt to households. That's the, the red line is private debt. Oh, sorry, how, uh, sorry, household, the black is the black line. Uh, so this is where the, the, my cursor is currently pointing at the at 2020, the beginning of 2020. And across 2020, the, this is the first nine months of the, uh, of the year, from, so from January to September, there's been an increase in private debt of households equivalent in America to about 5% of GDP. Now, that doesn't sound to me like people who are saving money. These are people borrowing from the banks to keep themselves afloat. So what we've got turning up in the national accounts is a decline in consumption, not as large a decline in, in income, and therefore Y minus C is larger, and therefore they say that's equal to savings, so savings has risen. Uh, but when you look at the, that is, that is a, a macroeconomic impact where the definition of, of consumption does not include servicing private debt. The way the accounts are defined, what we're doing with the banking sector is left out of the Y minus C calculation. So when you look at what the banking have to happening with the banking sector, households are more indebted now, much more indebted than they were at the beginning of 2020. And in fact, if you look at the steepness of that line, that's just over nine months, remember. This is data going back to 1945, and you won't see as steep an increase in household debt at any period before the COVID outbreak occurred. So my feeling is that that's completely wrong. Households are financially stressed. Um, the consumption has fallen dramatically. Therefore, given the definition of savings in the national accounts, that appears as an increase in savings. But in the real world, people are saving less. They're borrowing more to stay financially afloat. That's me. I finished. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I end rather abruptly. Okay, thanks. So I think it's Joe up now. Joe Polito. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear somebody. Yeah, is that Joe? Okay. Yeah, that's me. Um, <clears throat> great presentation. I really enjoyed that. I'm looking forward to being able to use the uh, recording. Um, two quick questions. Um, Kumhoff has said that the really the differences between MMT and sovereign money are just semantic. I'm wondering if you could comment on that. And I also wonder if you could comment on the uh, uh, fear of looming inflation that many people have proposed. Yeah. Well, first of all, Michael's another close mate of mine. In fact, he's one of the few people that I can use as an excuse for the line that some of my best friends are neoclassical economists. Michael, quite seriously, is one of my best friends. And he's mainstream, but he's one of the few mainstreamers who understands money. So he's taken his dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models and include the creation of money in them. And even in a DSGE framework, which is neoclassical and equilibrium, he shows the impact of credit very effectively. So he's spot on. Now, when you talk about positive money, what positive money really wants to do is to abolish fundamentally the capacity of private banks to create money. Yeah. Now, that is independent of whether um, uh, you think well, you can, you can believe that banks create money and believe that banks shouldn't create money at the same time. And that's what positive money is like. Michael and I believe that banks create money and that that should be allowed in circumstances where it's channeled towards the productive economy. So I'd be 
Uh, like I've, I've got a, a personal situation of my own, frankly, on this front where I had to do the loanable funds thing of lending to a family member to enable her to start a business. And put it this way, the Australian economy and my family would be in much better state if she could have gone to a local bank manager who could have recognised that she was, that she was a fantastic business person and given her the money instead and created the money into the local economy. That would have been a better outcome for everybody. Uh, so I want banks to be able to create money where their local banks that uh, know local businesses and lend on local understanding, which is the sort of thing Richard Verner says. So I'm not in favour of a complete abolition of the capacity of banks to create money. I actually fear, one of my fears is, there's not anything I've proven, but it's something I'm worried about, that if you had just the positive money idea that banks would borrow money from the central bank and then lend that out at a higher interest rate to the private private sector, that that would work effectively. I think it might actually reduce the rate of money growth more than people think, and it might make the banks be very conservative in lending the same way that I am now going to be about lending my money to anybody else, okay, after my experience in doing so. Um, and that might mean you get less dynamism out of the financial system for the physical economy when you actually need more dynamism. So uh, in that sense, I'm very, very much a supporter of positive money overall, but I think they need to be careful about making it too much and trying to prevent banks creating money at all. Uh, because if that fails, if we then have a financial crisis caused by that, the bankers will be the first one to say, oh, it was better when we used to run the system. Okay, and nobody will, you know, the, the short term memory humans have mean they could get away with it and be back in the same bloody situation again. And the failure of it the previous time could be used to argue against doing anything similar in a future occasion. Mind you, my worries these days are far more about whether we're going to have an economy at all, uh, given global warming. And that's another place where I blame neoclassical economists, but that's another topic. Yeah, okay. I think I should speak something for us, which is like positive money in Sweden, positive opinion. Steve and me, we don't agree on that picture when it comes to local banks anyway. So uh, it, mm. it's not, it's, we don't need to get into it anyway, because it doesn't uh, make any changes in what we went through so far. Yeah. But yeah. I'm quite con con uh, 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 convinced that you can have local banks that can have a withdrawing right from the from the state and then they borrow it to, to local businesses and for local uses and you you know according to those regulations that you have and yeah. i quite and i quite sure that works and it's also that let's say that we would have like a, a very bad situation like a, a disease or whatever and we need to shut down the, the the society it's really easy to put put, put uh, pay holidays on uh, debts that are origined from the uh, state which you can do in this case and it 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 goes through the whole system you know yeah. because because the, the state don't have any problem to to hold that because they don't need the cash flow right mm. Yeah, I mean, this is, if you if you combine this vision with the vision of, of money creation by deficits, uh, and the government having an unlimited capacity to do that, then part of that deficit can actually be financing loss, loans that make losses in the private banking sector, and redeeming the banks from that failure, because you actually want some losses to be made. This is one reason that I have a lot of time for Elon Musk, in general, and particularly while he's running SpaceX, he's quite happy to have lots of those jets blow up. Uh, because one blows up, the next one, you know why it blew up, and you can design iteratively very, very rapidly. So being afraid of losses is a major way we actually constrain innovation. Yeah. And if you're aware of that and you say, well, let's, you know, let the banks, you, you don't want banks to be given an unlimited license, they'll, they'll rip it off and end up going to the Bahamas with the money. We know what bankers can be like, uh, you know, not, not the most trustworthy people in the room. Uh, they're slightly more trustworthy than bank robbers, but only just. Okay, um, so you want to you want to have controls on that, and partly that's going to be personal consequences of bad loans and so on. But fundamentally, you do want to be able to finance innovation by the private sector, and innovation necessarily involves loss. Yeah. So what we're talking about that that we should actually look at the picture from a financing perspective, and that's not what we have talked about. When we're talking about the money system, that is how we finance different things in society, right? Mm. And so and question. If, yes, this is being recorded, Laman, so you can watch it later. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, so if you want in, in innovation, there's different ways of doing it. And there are like, what's her name uh, uh, from uh, London School of Economics, uh, Mariana Mazzucuto. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She writes quite a lot about that. To, you know, to say that states are uh, through the big breakthroughs in society is actually 
uh, research and innovations done by the state. But you know, uh, to me, it, it's a valid question, but I, I don't think we should elab elaborate that much more on it. I just wanted mm -hmm. to see that our view is that it's perfectly, uh, it, it works with local banks with withdrawal rights from the state. So the local banks don't have the right to create money in that way. Mm. And we all don't need to agree on it. That's the beauty of it. <laughs> but that's the thing that we pursue. So thanks, Joe. Are you happy with your, 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 your answers? Are oh, you... Joe, you're muted. Uh, in the other question was about inflation. If you're afraid, it, it, what you would oh, yeah. say to those who fear inflation and want to cut back on the spending because of that. Well, that's the cutting back on the spending for that reason is nonsense because, again, that's you're talking Larry Summers. I mean, if, if you want to get a reliable predictor of what to do, whatever Larry says, do the opposite, you're going to do pretty well. Okay, frankly, the guy gets far too much credence uh, out of his status rather than his actual track record. Um, so that's one reason to reject him straight away. One of the dangers that could lead to inflation is a collapse in the supply chain. Now, again, people like Larry have been responsible for making the supply chain as long as it is by encouraging globalization and relocation of production to China and so on. That's one reason America didn't have masks. It had outsourced the making of masks to China. Um, thank God they've got some vaccine producers domestically. But even there, look what they're doing in terms of the international. So we've had a global a globalization which went far too far, it should never have been encouraged to reach the scale that it has. Now, when the global supply chain breaks down, then of course, in that situation, the remaining goods are gonna be far less than people need and you may well have the sort of competition that occurred over buying those commodities and that might drive prices up quite possibly but equally it could drive people into bankruptcy and that's again what the neo particularly Larry Summers hasn't got a clue about because again he doesn't include the banking sector and he's thinking of how the economy operates and they're not looking at the level of the private debt which as I pointed out households and firms for that matter are much more indebted now than they were when the crisis began so that to me leaves me expect a breakdown rather than a huge inflationary surge. Mind you, the inflation could occur initially because of the impact of this destruction of the supply chain. Yeah, but then it's not the matter of the money supply, actually. It's a matter of the of, of supply of goods and services. Yeah, we, we, we suddenly find that what we've relied upon, the reason costs have fallen so much, we've had a huge deflationary impact from outsourcing production to China. If we've got to bring that production back on shore again, then yes, costs are going to rise potentially, and therefore prices could rise as a result of it. When they do, the capacity of people to meet those costs will be constrained by the financial situation they're now in of massive indebtedness. So the impact could be uh, inflation with a massive decline in the economy. And then in that situation, you'll want as much government spending as possible. And what you really need is a debt jubilee, which is another thing I've been arguing for for the last decade that I never thought would become a serious proposition. But I think a debt rejubilee may be the only way out of that double bind. And Larry mm. Summers will not be arguing for a debt jubilee. Mm. OK, thanks, Steve. Joe, I hope you're happy with that because we're going to go. Uh, it's I think it's done again. Or is there anybody else who's a taker? You guys are going to lower your hands there, so to speak. <laughs> Don, you've still got your hand up. Okay. Oh, you're also still muted. Oh, yeah, okay. There you go. There you go. I, was, I, was, I was muted. So uh, I was going to say that I was going to give you a gift, Steve, by talking about climate change, but you talked about it yourself. Um, but fair. the issue is growth. Um, so Mark Carney has, has got a book out suggesting that, you know, we can continue uh, for-profit growth economy if we just go green and change our investing models. But I think you believe, I think, that we can't continue to grow. We actually need, need to consume less. Mm. So, um, of course, it's when you create money for interest, who pays the interest? Well, growth pays the interest. So if we don't mm. want growth, can we really still have um, bank created money? So, you know, you, there's this de debate here about positive money and can we get rid of banks altogether? Actually, don't we have to if we're going to uh, address clim the climate crisis? Yeah, I completely agree with that, Don. I think we're going to be we're, we're, we're private private capitalism isn't going to function 
in a in massive decline of climate change. I, th I think we've we're, pro we're probably grown to three or four times the size our economy should be, certainly twice. Uh, that's been courtesy of neoclassical economists trashing the importance of the limits to growth study, which they didn't understand. And the main person responsible for it is William Nordhaus in terms of trashing that study, which was far more intelligent than anything a neoclassical economist has ever said. Um, so by ignoring their advice, we've trebled, possibly quadrupled our load on the planet, well past what can be sustained by the biosphere. And so we have to go backwards. And in that situation, for-profit corporations aren't going to be able to survive on private cash flow alone, and private banks will lose money hand over fist because there'll be so many bad debts, so many stranded assets. So I think in this situation, yes, a positive money type world where the government's creating the money is vital. But I, I, I think what we also have to do is avoid uh, amplifying the inequality that's come out of the level of private debt that's been allowed so far and the government rescue, so-called quantitative easing, which have also increased that inequality. So one thing I'm proposing uh, is, a, is a dual monetary system. We have money as we currently have it, but we also have universal carbon credits given out to everybody on the same basis. So every Canadian gets exactly the same carbon credit as every other Canadian. Um, every Australian, let's call Rupert Murdoch an Australian still. He was born there. We tried to get rid of him. Um, uh, so you get the same amount per head, um, maybe said initially at the average for the country. Now in that situation, if everybody got the average per capita carbon consumption, and every time you bought something, you have to pay both money and the carbon price of that, ob of that object, then 90% of it, maybe even 95% of us would never exhaust our carbon ration. But the top 10, top, certainly the top 5% would rapidly exhaust their ration and have to buy carbon credits off the poor. So that's a way of both rationing our impact upon the planet and also uh, enabling uh, a redistribution of wealth from the wealthy to the, to the poor, which I think is vital if we're going to get through the crunch we're going through, because you simply can't impose the restriction on consumption we're going to need on the poor, who are particularly talking at the global level, um, that means people starve to death. Now, um, to minimise that, you have to be the rich who starve and they can be they can be starved of their money by having to buy carbon credits. Okay, thanks. I think uh, next person would be Chester then. Yeah, hello, can you hear me? Yep, can't see you, we right. can hear you. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, no, I've got no webcam. Um, yeah, so uh, first, uh, thank you so much for all the work you do. Um, I was yeah. just wondering a short question uh, with regards to William Nordhaus, who you just mentioned. Mm. Have you approached the Swedish Riksbank, the Swedish Central Bank uh, Committee for the for the so-called Nobel Prize uh, with your paper criticizing William Nordhaus? Uh, I know he's seen it. Okay. okay. And the reason I know it is a, is a student in Cambridge invited him to be involved in the debate with me and Nordhaus uh, wrote an abusive email and blocked the guy. <laughs> okay. okay. So he's seen my views of him. Um, I, I, some activists took my views to the central bank as well, uh, the last uh, um, uh, Nobel Prize uh, ceremony. Uh, but of course, it's ignored. Um, you, you're not going to get through to the establishment until after they collapse. So um, we're stuck with stuck with it. And Nobel Prizes can't be withdrawn. Uh, that's one reason the guy who invented the uh, mustard gas uh, in the thick First World War uh, has still got his Nobel Prize for chemistry yeah. uh, because he gave us uh, fertilizer. And that's a major reason why we've overstepped the mark in the first place. We're actually, we're not, we're not uh, uh, eating green, we're eating brown because most of the food we generate is, is created by superphosphate. And he showed how to make superphosphate involving, of course, petrol as well as, 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 as uh, phosphate uh, to create it. So, um, yeah, we're stuck with uh, William Waterhouse's Nobel Prize, but that should be a reason to abolish the damn thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I agree yeah, entirely. Um, and I, um, well, I have a second question, and that would be, mm -hmm. have you approached any of the major <laughs> Swedish newspapers? I mean, that, that might be a I, bit parochial, I, really, but yeah. still. Please, please, look, please approach them for me, because uh, that paper of mine, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it up and show it on screen while we're talking. So pardon me being a bit distracted. My eyes will be looking elsewhere. As I uh, as I answer the question here, but I I was I've never I mean I've been criticizing neoclassical economics for the last fifty years, 
And in that entire time, I've never seen garbage as bad as what Nordhaus and his colleagues like Richard Toll have written on climate change uh, because they simply assumed, this is not a joke, they simply assumed that anything done indoors would be unaffected by climate change. Okay? One of the assumptions they made to regenerate the numbers they call data that they used to uh, fit their models to, one of the assumptions was that 87% of American industry would be unaffected because it occurs in what they call, what Nordhaus called carefully controlled environments. Now, this is my article. It's now available online again for free. Uh, it was for a while behind a paywall. So you can go and search for that and you'll find it and you can download it and take a look. This just chart, if you can see the chart I've got down here, these are their so-called estimates of the total impact of climate change, including one estimate that a one degree increase over pre-industrial temperatures will increase GDP by 2%. And then you look at a, this level here where they're looking at a, a three degree increase in, in temperature, they're saying at most a minus 4% change to GDP, even when you're looking at a 5.4 degree increase in temperature out here, they're saying only a 6% fall in GDP of what it would be in the total absence of climate change. And they got that by simply assuming, first of all, and this is, you can see this here in this quote, this is from the, um, uh, from the um, uh, IPCC. I'll just actually go back to a single page view so I can make that larger. So you can actually see that more clearly. Uh, but they, they say, are other sectors affected vulnerable to climate change? And activities such as agriculture, forestry, fisheries, and mining are exposed to the weather and thus vulnerable to climate change. Other activities such as manufacturing and services take place in controlled environments, i.e. In, 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 indoors under, under, the, under a roof or underground and are not really exposed to climate change. That's how stupid their work is on that front. Then they argue that you could use today's statistics about the temperature and GDP to predict what's gonna happen with climate change. So these dots here, this is me mocking their, their analysis. This is the, these are the United States of America with the horizontal showing how much the state's temperature deviates from the American average for the entire continent, continental USA of 11.5 degrees Celsius. And the vertical is how much the GDP differs from the average, which is, I think it's 30, 000, roughly 30,000 US dollars per person. And they fitted a curve to this, which is this quadratic here, and said, oh, that's going to, going to happen, happen with climate change. So we go from a world which is, uh, say, a state which is 11 degrees, uh, 11.5, so spot on the American average, and we go to here one which is 10 degrees warmer, this curve predicts that we're going to have a fall in GDP of no more than 30%. Now, if you go from this state to that state physically, what they're telling you, that's like time travel. That's like you know, hopping in a, in a time machine and going forward to a world which is 10 degrees warmer than where we are now. And that will be a world where the GDP will be 30 to 30% below what it would have been otherwise. But if, if you drive, let's say this state in the middle here is, uh, you know, Idaho, and this is Florida. If you drive from Idaho to Florida, the Arctic, the Arctic is still there. Well, if there's still sea ice in the Arctic. If you go forward in time, so this state goes from this temperature to 10 degrees or higher, the Arctic doesn't exist anymore. Neither will Greenland, neither will, neither will the, um, the Antarctic itself. Um, so this complete nonsense. So you can use today's data to predict what's going to happen with climate change. But that's what they've done. And that's why they've got these ridiculously low estimates for the impact of climate change. Um, so they've done absolutely horrifically bad work. And we are now going to be wearing the consequences of that because the planet couldn't give a shit about your theory, okay? It's going to tell you what reality is the hard way. And I think we're seeing that not just with um, uh, coronavirus this time round, what's happening with the climate globally as well. If you remember just a short while ago, about like what, one, one or two months ago, all of Texas was below zero. Yeah. All of Texas, right down to the coastline where Elon Musk launches his rockets. The, the, the coast, the, the, the water was below freezing, okay? Texas. And that's because of the weakening of the, uh, the polar vortex because of the decline in the, uh, in the amount of ice, uh, meaning that the, the jet stream is weaker so that cold air from the pole can come right down and freeze Texas. Now that sort of stuff is gonna get more and more dramatic over the next decade. I think we're gonna see how catastrophically wrong 
these arguments are. And only neoclassical economists would allow this shit to get published because neoclassical economists make stupid assumptions all the time and call them simplifying assumptions. So this disease they have of mistaking a, what's called a domain assumption for a simplifying one is why they've let this garbage get published in the first place and give it a Nobel Prize. You know? So we're going to look back at some point and say, how on earth was this garbage even published, let yeah. alone given a Nobel Prize? And it's fundamentally because we've got Ptolemaic astronomers in charge of the economics letting this stuff get published because they think it's quite reasonable to assume the Earth is the centre of the universe. Okay, thanks on that, Steve. I think we need to take the last question then, which is Richard, and then we need to wrap up. Yeah, uh, I've got to have I dinner. Need to jump into next meeting. <laughs> so, Richard, Richard. Okay, my question yep. is: um, Do banks use the savers' money for anything? The private they, person starts a saving in the bank. They can if you hand your money over in a term deposit. Okay, because if you look, like for example, if if you have a thousand dollars in the bank, okay in a in a call deposit and then you go to get money out of the order teller and you want to take out nine hundred dollars and the bank says sorry you've overdriven you've only got five hundred okay what would you do you go to the bank and say who's taking my money now your money when you put it in a deposit account goes into a general account the banks uh, every pull everybody's money together so the only way that can actually happen that they could use your money is you live in a term deposit and then in a term deposit, the bank could lend a term deposit to somebody, to another customer. I say, well, if you get a term deposit, then yes, it can happen. But the call deposits, which we put all our money into, is not in any sense something which has been reserved so the banks can give it to somebody else. That's, I'm finished. Yeah, happy with that, Richard. Richard. It gets muted. Okay. Uh, okay. Thanks a lot, everybody, for, for coming today and hanging in here for quite a, some time. And Steve, thanks a lot for taking your time and uh, your excellent presentation, your uh, explanations. And if any of you guys there have any questions, so just mail us on info at Positiva Penga. And also, I, I really love to see you all on when Michael Hudson is here, April the 6th. It's too late for me, but say hi to Michael and uh, have a lot of fun. That's one o'clock in the morning for me, so I can't be there. Yeah, yeah, I know. But Michael, is, uh, he's worth listening to every absolutely, time. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So, All right, see you all later. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, everybody. Bye. Bye.